I closed the door behind me, my eyes held shut and my ears ringing. The hum was surrounding me. As the door clicked into place, the hum was gone. I opened my eyes in surprise and the door I had shut was gone. It was just a wall now. I looked around in shock. The room was identical to room three. The same chair and lamp, but with the correct amount of shadows this time. The only real difference was that there was no exit door, and the one I came in through was gone. As I said before, I had no previous issues in terms of mental instability, but at that moment I fell into what I now know was insanity. I didn't scream. I didn't make a sound. At first, I scratched softly. The wall was tough, but I knew the door was there somewhere. I just knew it was. I scratched at where the doorknob was. I clawed at the wall frantically with both hands, my nails being filed down to the skin against the wood. I fell silently to my knees, the only sound in the room the incessant scratching against the wall. I knew it was there. The door was there. I knew it was just there. I knew if I could just get past this wall. I jumped off the ground and spun in one motion. I leaned against the wall behind me, and I saw what it was that spoke to me. To this day, I regret ever turning round. There was a little girl. She was wearing a soft, white dress that went down to her ankles. She had long, blonde hair to the middle of her back, and white skin and blue eyes. She was the most frightening thing I had ever seen, and I know that nothing in my life will ever be as unnerving as what I saw in her. While looking at her, I saw something else. Where she stood, I saw what looked like a man's body, only larger than normal and covered in hair. He was naked from head to toe, but his head was not human and his toes were hooves. It wasn't the devil, but at that moment it might as well have been. The form had the head of a ram and the snout of a wolf. It was horrifying, and it was synonymous with the little girl in front of me. They were the same form. I can't really describe it, but I saw them at the same time. They shared the same spot in that room, but it was like looking at two separate dimensions. When I saw the girl, I saw the form, and when I saw the form, I saw the girl. I couldn't speak. I could barely even see. My mind was revolting against what it was attempting to process. I had been scared before in my life, and I had never been more scared than when I was trapped in the fourth room, but that was before room six. I just stood there, staring at whatever it was that spoke to me. There was no exit. I was trapped here with it, and then it spoke again. David, you should have listened. When it spoke, I heard the words of the little girl, but the other form spoke through my mind in a voice I won't attempt to describe. There was no other sound. The voice just kept repeating that sentence over and over in my mind, and I agreed. I didn't know what to do. I was slipping into madness yet couldn't take my eyes off what was in front of me. I dropped to the floor. 
I thought I had passed out, but the room wouldn't let me. I just wanted it to end. I was on my side, my eyes wide open, and the form staring down at me. Scurrying across the floor in front of me was one of the battery-powered rats from the second room. The house was toying with me, but for some reason, seeing that rat pulled my mind back from whatever depths it was headed, and I looked around the room. I was getting out of there. I was determined to get out of that house and live and never think about this place again. I knew this room was hell, and I wasn't ready to take up a residency. At first, it was just my eyes that moved. I searched the walls for any kind of opening. The room wasn't that big, so it didn't take long to soak up the entire layout. The demon still taunted me the voice growing louder as the form stayed rooted where it stood. I placed my hand on the floor, lifted myself up to all four, and turned to scan the wall behind me. Then I saw something I couldn't believe. The form was now right at my back, whispering into my mind how I shouldn't have come. I felt its breath on the back of my neck, but I refused to turn around. A large rectangle was scratched into the wood, with a small dent chipped away in the centre of it. Right in front of my eyes, I saw the large seven I had mindlessly etched into the wall. I knew what it was. Room seven was just beyond that wall where room five was moments ago. I don't know how I had done it. Maybe it was just my state of mind at the time, but I had created the door. I knew I had. In my madness, I had scratched into the wall what I needed the most. An exit to the next room. Room 7 was close. I knew the demon was right behind me, but for some reason it couldn't touch me. I closed my eyes and placed both hands on the large seven in front of me. I pushed. I pushed as hard as I could. The demon was now screaming in my ear. It told me I was never leaving. It told me that this was the end, but I wasn't going to die. I was going to live there in room six with it. I wasn't. I pushed and screamed at the top of my lungs. I knew I was going to push through the wall eventually. I clenched my eyes shut and screamed, and the demon was gone. I was left in silence. I turned around slowly and was greeted by the room as it was when I entered. Just a chair and a lamp. I couldn't believe it, but I didn't have time to dwell. I turned back to the seven and jumped back slightly. What I saw was a door. It wasn't the one I had scratched in, but a regular door, with a large seven on it. My whole body was shaking. It took me a while to turn the knob. I just stood there for a while, staring at the door. I couldn't stay in room six. I couldn't, but if this was only room six... I couldn't imagine what Seven had in store. I must have stood there for an hour, just staring at the Seven. Finally, with a deep breath, I twisted the knob and opened the door to room Seven. I stumbled through the door, mentally exhausted and physically weak. The door behind me closed, and I realised where I was. I was outside. Not outside like room five, but actually outside. My eyes stung. I wanted to cry. I fell to my knees and tried, but I couldn't. I was finally out of that hell. 
I didn't even care about the prize that was promised. I turned and saw that the door I just went through was the entrance. I walked to my car and drove home, thinking of how nice a shower sounded. As I pulled up to my house, I felt uneasy. The joy of leaving No End House had faded, and dread was slowly building in my stomach. I shook it off as residual from the house and made my way to the front door. I entered and immediately went up to my room. There on my bed was my cat, Baskerville. He was the first living thing I had seen all night, and I reached to pet him. He hissed and swiped at my hand. I recoiled in shock as he had never acted like that. I thought, whatever, he's an old cat. I jumped in the shower and got ready for what I was expecting to be a sleepless night. After my shower, I went to the kitchen to make something to eat. I descended the stairs and turned into the family room. What I saw would be forever burned into my mind, however. My parents were lying on the ground, naked and covered in blood. They were mutilated to near unidentifiable states. Their limbs were removed and placed next to their bodies, and their heads were placed on their chests facing me. The most unsettling part was their expressions. They were smiling, as though they were happy to see me. I vomited and sobbed there in the family room. I didn't know what had happened. They didn't even live with me at the time. I was a mess. Then I saw it. A door that was never there before. A door with a large eight scrawled on it in blood. I was still in the house. I was standing in my family room, but I was in room seven. The faces of my parents smiled wider as I realised this. They weren't my parents. They couldn't be, but they looked exactly like them. The door marked eight was across the room, behind the mutilated bodies in front of me. I knew I had to move on, but at that moment I gave up. The smiling faces tore into my mind. They grounded me where I stood. I vomited again and nearly collapsed. Then the hum returned. It was louder than ever, and it filled the house and shook the walls. The hum compelled me to walk. I began to walk slowly, making my way closer to the door and the bodies. I could barely stand, let alone walk, and the closer I got to my parents, the closer I came to suicide. The walls were now shaking so hard, it seemed as though they were going to crumble, but still, the faces smiled at me. As I inched closer, their eyes followed me. I was now between the two bodies, a few feet away from the door. The dismembered hands clawed their way across the carpet towards me. All the while, the faces continued to stare. New terror washed over me, and I walked faster. I didn't want to hear them speak. I didn't want the voices to match those of my parents. They began to open their mouths, and the hands were inches from my feet. In a dash of desperation, I lunged toward the door, threw it open, and slammed it behind me. Room 8 I was done. After what I had just experienced, I knew there was nothing else this fucking house could throw at me that I couldn't live through. There was nothing short of the fires of hell that I wasn't ready for. Unfortunately, 
I underestimated the abilities of No End House. Unfortunately, things got more disturbing, more terrifying, and more unspeakable in Room 8. I still have trouble believing what I saw in Room 8. Again, the room was a carbon copy of Rooms 3 and 6, but sitting in the usually empty chair was a man. After a few seconds of disbelief, my mind finally accepted the fact that the man sitting in the chair was me. Not someone who looked like me. It was David Williams. I walked closer. I had to get a better look, even though I was sure of it. He looked up at me and I noticed tears in his eyes. Please, please don't do it. Please don't hurt me. What? I asked. Who are you? I'm not going to hurt you. Yes, you are. He was sobbing now. You're going to hurt me and I don't want you to. He sat in the chair with his legs up and began rocking back and forth. It was actually pretty pathetic looking, especially since he was me, identical in every way. Listen, who are you? I was now only a few feet from my doppelganger. It was the weirdest experience yet standing there talking to myself. I wasn't scared, but I would be soon. Why are you... You're going to hurt me, you're going to hurt me, you're going to hurt me, you're going to hurt me. If you want to leave, you're going to hurt me. Why are you saying this? Just calm down, all right? Let's try and figure this. And then I saw it. The David sitting down was wearing the same clothes as me except for a small red patch on his shirt, embroidered with the number nine. You're going to hurt me, you're going to hurt me, you're going to hurt me. Don't, please, you're going to hurt me. My eyes didn't leave that small number on his chest. I knew exactly what it was. The first few doors were plain and simple, but after a while they got a little more ambiguous. Seven was scratched into the wall, but by my own hands. Eight was marked in blood above the bodies of my parents. But nine, this number was on a person, a living person. Worse still, it was on a person that looked exactly like me. David? I had to ask. Yes. You're going to hurt me, you're going to hurt me, you're going to hurt me. He continued to sob and rock. He answered to David. He was me, right down to the voice. But that nine. I paced around for a few minutes while he sobbed in his chair. The room had no door, and similarly to room six, the door I came through was gone. For some reason, I assumed that scratching would get me nowhere this time. I studied the walls and floor around the chair, sticking my head underneath and seeing if anything was below. Unfortunately, there was. Below the chair was a knife. Attached was a tag that read, To David, from Management. The feeling in my stomach as I read that tag was something sinister. I wanted to throw up, and the last thing I wanted to do was remove that knife from under the chair. The other David was still sobbing uncontrollably. My mind was spinning into an attic of unanswerable questions. Who put this here, and how did they get my name? Not to mention the fact that as I knelt on the cold wood floor, I also sat in that chair, sobbing in protest of being hurt by myself. It was all too much to process. 
the house and the management had been playing with me this whole time. My thoughts for some reason turned to Peter, and whether or not he got this far. If he did, if he met a Peter Terry, sobbing in this very chair, rocking back and forth, I shook those thoughts out of my head. They didn't matter. I took the knife from under the chair and immediately the other David went quiet. David, he said in my voice, what do you think you're going to do? I lifted myself from the ground and clenched the knife in my hand. I'm going to get out of here. David was still sitting in the chair, though he was very calm now. He looked up at me with a slight grin. I couldn't tell if he was going to laugh or strangle me. Slowly, he got up from the chair and stood, facing me. It was uncanny. His height, and even the way he stood, matched mine. I felt the rubber hilt of the knife in my hand and gripped it tighter. I don't know what I was planning on doing with it, but I had a feeling I was going to need it. No. His voice was slightly deeper than my own. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt you, and I'm going to keep you here. I didn't respond. I just lunged and tackled him to the ground. I had mounted him and looked down, knife poised and ready. He looked up at me, terrified. It was like I was looking in a mirror. Then the hum returned, low and distant, though I still felt it deep in my body. David looked up at me as I looked down at myself. The hum was getting louder, and I felt something inside me snap. With one motion, I slammed the knife into the patch on his chest and ripped down. Blackness fell on the room, and I was falling. The darkness around me was like nothing I had experienced up to that point. Room four was dark, but it didn't come close to what was completely engulfing me. I wasn't even sure if I was falling after a while. I felt weightless, covered in dark. Then a deep sadness came over me. I felt lost, depressed and suicidal. The sight of my parents entered my mind. I knew it wasn't real, but I had seen it, and the mind has trouble differentiating between what is real and what isn't. The sadness only deepened. I was in room nine for what seemed like days. The final room. And that's exactly what it was. The end. No end house had an end, and I had reached it. At that moment I gave up. I knew I would be in that in-between state forever, accompanied by nothing but darkness. Not even the hum was there to keep me sane. I had lost all senses. I couldn't feel myself. I couldn't hear anything. Sight was completely useless here. I searched for a taste in my mouth and found nothing. I felt disembodied and completely lost. I knew where I was. This was hell. Room nine was hell. Then it happened. A light. One of those stereotypical lights at the end of the tunnel. I felt ground come up from below me, and I was standing. After a moment or two of gathering my thoughts and senses, I slowly walked toward that light. As I approached the light, it took form. 
It was a vertical slit in the side of an unmarked door. I slowly walked through the door and found myself back where I had started, the lobby of No End House. It was exactly how I left it, still empty, still decorated with childish Halloween decorations. After everything that had happened that night, I was still wary of where I was. After a few moments of normalcy, I looked around the place, trying to find anything different. On the desk was a plain white envelope with my name handwritten on it. Immensely curious, yet still cautious, I mustered up the courage to open the envelope. Inside was a letter, again handwritten. David Williams. Congratulations. You have made it to the end of No End House. Please accept this prize as a token of great achievement. Yours forever, management. With the letter were five $100 bills. I couldn't stop laughing. I laughed for what seemed like hours. I laughed as I walked out to my car and laughed as I drove home. <laughs> I laughed as I pulled into my driveway. I laughed as I opened my front door to my house and laughed as I saw the small town etched into the wood. <laughs>